Hey guys, welcome back to our channel, The Upper Hand. Over the next few weeks and even months, we're going to be focusing on different types of assessments that you may find yourself using during, throughout a treatment session. So today we're going to start by covering the dynamometer, how to use it, um, how to read it, and different ways to utilize it to test in various ways. And if you stick around at the end of the video, we'll throw in a few clinical pearls that I think would, you would find really helpful. And if you happen to be seeing this on our Instagram page, uh, make sure you go over to our YouTube channel. Make sure you like and subscribe and follow us there. Uh, the majority of our video content will be located there. Um, and we feel like it would be very helpful for you if you find yourself watching this video. So stick around and let's get right into it. All right guys, so we're gonna take a look at this dynamometer here. Specifically, this is a JMAR brand dynamometer. That's what we have in all of our clinics or different brands and companies out there who make these. But if you're interested in a JMAR dynamometer, we'll include a link below if you're interested in obtaining one of those for your clinic or your practice. Um, if you look at the front of the dynamometer here, there are two different gauges. There's a kilograms of force and there's a pounds of force uh, side. We use the pounds of force, but if you're on the metric system, you may prefer to use the kilograms of force and when you're measuring someone's strength as they grip and squeeze this, the needle moves up and there's a second needle that you can see that stays in place. So you don't have to worry about memorizing where the number stopped at So because when the force comes off, the second needle will stay in place and you'll be able to read that measurement. Also, there are five positions that the handle can be placed in. 95% of the time we're in position two. There's one, two, three, four, five, five being the outer position. We're most of the time in the second position because most people's hands fit just comfortably around that. If you had a pediatric patient, you may shift it back to position one. If you have a person with a very large hand, you may unclick this bottom ring here and shift it to position three or something of that nature or wherever you need it to test there. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and test Parker's grip strength here, just to give you an idea of what it looks like to actually perform the dynamometry test on a patient. Okay guys, so first we're gonna talk about patient positioning. Ideally, they'd be in a, sitting in a chair like this normally when you're testing grip strength. Uh, you want their arm down by their side and you want their elbow flexed at 90 degrees um, because if they come out of that position when they're testing they tend to be able to compensate with other muscle groups so you want to make sure they're here arm by their side elbow at 90 degrees all right so we're going to go ahead and test parker's grip strength here and i would instruct him to just squeeze as tight as he can for a few seconds give max effort and i would encourage him not to jerk it when he's squeezing because sometimes when they jerk at the beginning that can alter the reading and make the needle pop up really quick at the beginning Typically, as a therapist, I would cradle the dynamometer, but I don't want to influence the strength reading, so I'll just kind of cradle it on the bottom with my hand and balance it on the top to where that I'm not influencing it, but I'm giving it uh, some stability here. And he's going to squeeze, and I tell the patient when they squeeze, don't expect to feel the handle to come down because typically they won't feel anything move, and sometimes they wonder, is it working? And the needle's moving on our side even though they don't feel anything. So, all right, Parker, go ahead and give me a max effort. Squeeze as tight as you can for a few seconds and relax. And so as you can see, that needle stayed up, and Parker is at 40 pounds. Didn't have his Wheaties this morning, disappointing. Just kidding, it was not. It's 120 pounds, 125, which is a normal range. And one more thing that we typically do is we, if there are no precautions or contraindications for testing the grip strength on the contralateral upper extremity, we go ahead and test both um, just to get an idea of what a norm is for that person because there's a normal range, uh, but every person's a little bit different. So we typically test both upper extremities just to get an idea of what that person's strength is like. All right, a few other things we wanted to talk about is if you have a patient uh, that may you feel may be given some maximal effort, there are a few ways that you can use this dynamometer to test uh, some validity. And we're going to talk about a few of those here. Um, so the first one we're going to talk about is we meant, or Dylan mentioned earlier that there are five levels on the dynamometer. So if we were to test Dylan's grip strength on all five levels, starting with number one, going all the way to number five, you're going to see what is known as a bell curve. So it's going to kind of start out low, it's going to go up, hit a peak, and then it should start coming back down. With somebody that's giving submaximal effort, sometimes you notice that they don't have that typical bell-shaped curve. So just to give an example and show with Dylan, 
I'm going to let him elbow it aside. I'm supporting. Squeeze as hard as you comfortably can. And relax. Got about 105 there. So typically we're going to see this next number jump up a little bit. All right. Go ahead and squeeze again for me. All right. Very good. He's got 120 there. Most people max out at around the second or third level. I've seen it both ways. It just all depends on how big their hand is. I would guess that this one would be close to the same or is going to jump up a little bit higher than that 120 that he just had. So go ahead and squeeze one more time for me and relax. And he had 125 there. Okay. So now, as you see on the dynamometer, as we're getting further out, we're on the fourth level now. I can't make anywhere near a full fist, so we are recruiting different muscles um, to, to obtain this grip strength. So I'm going to go ahead and let him grab that. Go ahead, squeeze, and relax. He had about 105 there, so now we've, we've hit our peak and we've started coming back down. And we go all the way out to the fifth one. As he, if he's given maximal effort, this number should go down as well and he had around 85. So that just shows you a typical bell curve and how it should be. Many times that's not the case when somebody's giving them submaximal effort. They don't understand that and they can't keep up with how hard they squeezed on the time before because they're not giving good effort. So another way that you can give a type of validity test is to allow the patient to perform a three trial average. So allow them to test their grip strength three times. Then you'll average those numbers together and see the difference in each of those numbers. And there should not be a coefficient of variation of greater than 15% between those numbers. So for example, if you had a patient and they tested 100 grip pounds in the first trial, 40 grip pounds on the second trial, for example, um, and 85 on the third trial, that 40 is going to be well outside of that 15% difference. And so then you would know that there's something suspicious going on and then you can further investigate that with further validity testing. Okay, another way you may um, test if someone's giving their maximal effort is perform a sustained grip. So what I'll have the patient do is to grip the dynamometer as hard as they possibly can comfortably for a 10 second period. So if someone's giving max effort, typically what you're going to see that line do is go all the way to the top and peak pretty quickly within a few seconds and then fatigue is going to set in and that number is going to start going down, 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 down. By the time it hits that 10 seconds, it should be a good bit further down than it was um, at your peak. So a lot of times what we'll see if someone's not giving max effort is you'll see a flat line. So somebody, you'll say go, they'll squeeze, they're at 50, 50, 50, they stay at 50 the entire time. So that tells you that they did not give the max effort in the beginning because they didn't have a peak and that's why they were able to sustain that grip for a full 10 second period. Also another thing you could see um, that line do is go up, say so you get to about 50 and then you go down a little bit, get to about the six, seven second range and you try to tell them, okay, come on, squeeze hard and then they pop it up even higher past that 50 degree mark, you know that that, um, that early on when they hit 50 that it was not their maximal effort. So again, that's just a way you can use sustained grip on, with the dynamometer to test the validity of the patient's effort. Last way you can test um, validity using this dynamometer would be a rapid grip exchange or rapid exchange. And with this test, you're going to usually leave it on level two. And I'm going to have Dylan here have both hands out, right and left hand and I will be in complete control of the dynamometer. So he is not grabbing it from my hands or anything like that. I'm going to place it in his hands. He's, I'm going to ask him to squeeze as hard as he comfortably can. Go squeeze. And then I'm going to swip, swap it to this hand. Squeeze, 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 squeeze. And what happens is when you're going that fast, if you're not giving maximal effort, the patient can't determine, okay, I didn't squeeze quite that hard on this one last the last time so I got to do it again and they just can't they can't be consistent giving submaximal effort so you're gonna see a number that may be a good bit higher you know 20 or 30 pounds higher than what you saw on um, previous attempts so um, there's also a way you can do a coefficient of variation on this test as well and again if it's over that 15 percent um, mark then you know that submaximal effort is likely and so one other clinical pearl we want to leave you with at the end is that typically uh, patients 
dominant hand is five to ten percent stronger than their non-dominant hand so that's just something to keep in mind when you're testing both upper extremities and comparing them as we mentioned earlier so ideally if you're rehabbing for example the dominant upper extremity by the end of rehab and you're looking for an outcome of hopefully five to ten percent more grip pounds than the non-dominant upper extremity hey guys thank you so much for taking time out of your day to watch this video we hope you learned something today and that this was helpful to you in some way. So you know our goal for this channel, the upper hand, is to give you guys the upper hand as you seek to better understand conditions of the upper extremity and just all topics related to occupational therapy in general. So please take a second out of your day, make sure you like this video and subscribe to this channel so that you can be sure that you're going to see all of our upcoming videos. Thank you guys so much and we'll see you next time.